Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your time. My aim in the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes is to take you through an update for TR Property, how we performed the last 12 months, how we've performed through the early stages of this crisis, uh, and a look at um, our outlook and the shape of the portfolio. Just a, a little bit of background to start with. We're going to cover a high level of what the trust does, look at the track record, and then focus just for a while on the uh, recent dividend announcement, which I think is very important. As I said, we'll look at what happened since February and our positioning and, and outlook, and also touch on our physical property portfolio, which I'll come on to in a second. What are we? Um, we are the largest pan-European property equity investment trust. These slides are already a little bit uh, out of date in as much as the current discount is about 9.5% rather than 143 We are closed-ended, and that is a major advantage for us. Um, it gives us the ability to take long-term views and very opportunistically at the moment buy into a number of companies that are trading at very deep discounts to their asset value or they are particularly unloved because they may be their small cap or there's a determined seller and then we can own these smaller companies knowing that we are not going to be forced to sell them out uh, because of a redemption or anything and that's a, a, a major a major benefit as i mentioned we can own physical property up to 15 percent uh, that's currently 8% of the Nest assets, and we'll talk about that in a moment. We actually had an increase in the value of our physical portfolio in the in the second half of the year, so that's uh, up to the 31st of March uh, this year. And gearing, um, we do have the potential to gear. That 12% may strike you as quite a high number given market conditions, but please bear in mind that with 8% of our assets in physical property, if I wish to be long the equity market relative to our benchmark, then of course I, I'm effectively, I'm only sort of 4% long the equity market at the moment, having adjusted for that exposure to, to physical property. And then performance, what we've got up here on the left-hand side is the half year to September 2019 on the right, full year results uh, recently announced. Obviously the fact that the returns over that period were negative uh, is a disappointment. However, the NAV fell less than our benchmark, um, which is good. And that's the uh, ninth year in a row that we've managed to beat the benchmark. So that's a positive. Um, share price performance, um, obviously, just to show you how volatile things are, whilst over those 12 months, the share price performance was minus 16%. Um, we've recouped uh, that uh, and more since the 31st of March. So that's encouraging. And the discount um, has has narrowed again, uh, as I as I mentioned. Whilst I just briefly touch on on the team, obviously the investment trust is our largest fund. We we actually run six separate mandates. I'm not going to dwell on these um, for too long, um, but just to explain that this really helps us uh, support a very large team, uh, which is there for the benefit of the investment trust, but also other clients. So we 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 get a lot of bang for our buck. And then you'll see that there's two fund managers, Albon Lanier and myself, uh, two analysts. George Gay, who's worked with me for a very long time, uh, runs the physical real estate portfolio of the investment trust, but also of property growth and income. Uh, and then Joe Elliott, our CFO, has been with us um, for a very, a very, very long time. And the history of our of this team's involvement is we originally were part of the Thames River Capital fund management business that was acquired by FNC. And then FNC was acquired by Bank of Montreal. And I think what is crucially important is we are owner managers. That uh, Thames River Capital LLP still exists. We are part owners of it, as our uh, Bank of Montreal. Um, so we're very much alongside uh, investors and other members of the team um, have significant holdings um, in the investment trust as well. Uh, track record, um, don't want to dwell on this. You can um, look at this on the website at any time. We're not there to crow. We're just there to point out of you know, how pleased we've been with the long-term track record. Uh, performance recently looks very dramatic. You'd be better off having a logarithmic scale, obviously. Uh, but if you look at the box underneath, that's a, a clear indication. And, and under FCA rules, we are required to give you this next patch of data. Um, any of these numbers I talk about in the future, we have to make sure it's up front and center in the, in the presentation. So let's get into the meat of, of the presentation. 
TR Props is a, uh, the TR actually stands originally for Fatouche Remnant, the fund management business that was owned by Henderson, which we left in 2004 and we moved to Thames River Capital. So it was just very much serendipitous that the name worked well at TRC. Um, now, obviously part of the BMO stable and we, we, we like to say that the TR stands for total return. Um, and that's really what you get from, from real estate. Um, obviously income is a crucial part of, of your total return. Um, and we're very pleased to have generated a incremental dividend uh, growth rate, a compound growth rate of 9.4%. Um, for the year to March uh, 2020, um, our total earnings were 14.6p um, and the board declared and paid out uh, and we'll be paying out 14 pence in total. So that's a growth of 3.7%. Now, for many of you who follow REITs and property companies, you will know that many have either suspended or deferred uh, dividends. Uh, and the board felt strongly that this income had been earned by shareholders and was uh, due to shareholders. In addition, we do actually have uh, revenue reserves, which equate to about approximately uh, one full year of, of, of distribution. Um, and they're there to be used in the event that we had a, a period of time where earnings dropped. And if we could see the earning recovery uh, in due course, that's when you would use those reserves. So I think that's something the board uh, very much bore in mind um, when they decided on the dividend. But also, and we'll come on to it a bit later, you know, a lot of where we're, um, our, our exposure uh, is to businesses which actually have had um, very strong uh, revenue collection uh, and the potential for revenue growth, but we'll come to that in a second. And then really, I thought, you know, to sort of bust a myth um, about the trust, obviously we're a, a UK listed investment trust, but we're very much pan-European. In fact, um, more of our assets are in Europe uh, than in the UK. Uh, and you can see that split on, on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, breaking down our exposure to various parts of Europe, I think it's very important that really almost you know, half the portfolio, half our European exposure is really Germany, a little bit in Austria, which I've, I, I've added in. But we're, we're very comfortable with that. We see the German economy is very much dealt with the COVID crisis in as best a way as anybody could. Um, they've been very quick to uh, furlough and support employees and companies, both uh, large and small. Um, and our residential exposure, which we'll, we'll talk about more in a bit, Detail has seen um, effectively 100% uh, rent recovery uh, and our commercial exposure, very, very high levels of, of, of rent recovery there as well. So you know, very, um, very encouraging. And then moving to the next slide, is a, there's a lot of numbers on here. So I'm, I'll just take a bit of time to walk you through this. What we're trying to explain with this slide is how pan-European real estate equities have performed through the crisis. So from the pre-crisis peak of the 19th of February, to the immediate trough, which was effectively a month later, the 18th of March, and then the bounce back to the end of May, um, and then a look across from peak to now. These sectors, as you can see, are not all um, by country or by sector. Sometimes they're pan-Europe, sometimes they're pure single, single sector, single country, but there's the way we choose to divide up our world and look at our, our companies in these, in these baskets. And what's so interesting is the names at the top, such as German residential, industrial, Swedish residential, healthcare, self-storage. These are the, the, the names that really fell the least in the drawdown. At the bottom, you've got, not surprisingly, uh, London retail, European shopping centers. Um, maybe Stockholm offices was a surprise, hotels and UK retail, all of consumer-facing sectors, with the exception of Stockholm offices, which will definitely touch on the second, they very much performed the worst. And that's uh, as you would expect. And then in terms of the, the bounce and the sort of market conditions we're in at the moment, again, those that fell the least then bounced the most uh, in, in, in many cases. Hotels being the obvious exception. We only have uh, one pure hotel name. That's a business called Pandox um, uh, in Sweden. Others, other, all our, the other companies that own hotels are very much part of a uh, of conglomerates um so and, and really what you know what has been driving this it's been all about income uh what we have here is a a demand strike this is not a repeat of the gfc of 2008 we haven't got distressed leverage the banks are not the uh, the bad guys this time around um this situation is about you know, can tenants pay will they pay 
um, and what sectors your investments in. That's the, that's the important part. So coming back to what we talked about German residential, industrial would include logistics. That, of course, has done very well um, uh, on the back of this constant rotation from us buying, going to shops to buy uh, our goods uh, to the focus of moving online. And we've seen a huge surge, obvious surge in, in demand for, for online and stuff. Um, and then, of course, healthcare uh, has not surprisingly done, uh, done very well. And then a look at our positioning. So what we have here, if you look at the top line, so industrial, German residential, this is where the hashed part is our relative overweight uh, to the benchmark. Um, and then the, 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 the solid part is the absolute position, the solid part being the, the exposure of the benchmark, uh, the benchmark exposure. Therefore, if you add the two together, you get our, our total exposure. And you'll see this is a, you know, these very, very dominant sectors. You'll also see German offices and French offices uh, are, are significant parts of the market. Um, and then down the bottom, you'll see our where Asia is you know, very underweight um, Switzerland. Uh, obviously underweight European shopping centres we talked about um, and actually underweight the UK majors so that's just land sec and British land um, as, a, as a combined group we're actually um, overweight land securities but we, we hold, currently hold no exposure to British land and that's a bigger underweight than the than the than the overweight um, but we'll talk more about these as we go through okay and then for those of you who are interested more in obviously in the absolute holdings um, and our positions names that will be some of these will be very familiar to you. You'll see a very large holding, Argon, our third largest holding. And worth just dwelling on that for a moment. This is actually a small cap. Uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's not quite as small as it was, but it's 50% it's owned by the founding family. It's a French uh, logistics um, developer and investor, 50% um, owned by the Lalonde family. Um, I would encourage you to, to look up this stock. We, we started buying these shares uh, six or seven years ago, um, and it's been a fantastic uh, win for us. Um, we're very excited about the prospects. Um, they recently did a very large transaction, effectively buying in uh, a portfolio um, of Carrefour uh, logistics warehouses um, in certain leasebacks. Um, very, very exciting. Um, and then moving sort of further down uh, that list, uh, other names that you might not be familiar with. TAG is a German residential business, as is Deutsche Wohnen and LEG in Venovia, so that's our holdings in German residential. Unite is the student accommodation. Um, great business, very well run. Clearly, um, there's some existential risk here as to when our, uh, when is tertiary education going to reopen? Will it reopen for students in October? But uh, either way, it's an ex extremely well run business. And they've, uh, I think, done a very good job at managing the process so far. The share price uh, dropped a very long way. It gave us an opportunity to add to our position. Stock has now recovered to, to closer to £9.50, £10, which is good. And then further down, VIB Vermogen. This is a Bavarian uh, logistics and industrial developer. Um, again, core holdings by um, management and founders. And we've been in this stock for uh, five or six years now and, 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 and watched it grow. And it's been, a, it's been a great business. And at the bottom, Derwent London has returned to the portfolio. This is London uh, offices. We sold out of the stock six months ago at much, much higher prices, I'm pleased to say. On the back of the sort of rally, well, I suppose effectively in the Boris bounce, London suddenly came back into favour. People had stopped worrying about it um, being a, 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 the, the Brexit concern. And the stock then fell to, to our point, to, to my view, in the middle of this crisis um, to far, far too cheap a, a level of £28. Uh, and we're busy buying it. We don't believe that we are the end of the office is nigh. And I'm happy to talk about that more in due course okay so sort of a bit of a summary of where we are and some of the points i've already made but just to sort of pull them together uh, ow stands for overweight sheds meds and beds and, and look at what has worked and what hasn't for us in the last both pre pre-covid and uh, during during the crisis clearly logistics residential healthcare we've talked about Assurer raised a lot of money. I made the point that we were disappointed because it, uh, we think it overraised, um, and uh, the balance sheet is now not as not as tight as we would like. It's obviously got very good income and very secure income, so we're hopeful that management will deploy that capital um, quite quickly. We're hopeful for that. 
And then student accommodation, um, obviously, as I mentioned, Unite, great business, but we, you know, we have seen that temporary income collapse as campuses close. It's the one stock where, you know, if it, the recovery is, is going to be, you know, really quite sort of unilateral, in, in for want of a better word, it, it will come straight back if students are able to return to campuses in, in October. Whereas for many other businesses, corporate business, we think that the recovery will be, you know, shallower and take much more time. And hotels are a natural example of that. There will be a, an initial flurry of activities, particularly uh, for um, for holidays is rather business. We'll see hotels being, being, you know, occupancy climbing, but from very, very low levels. But as you can see from the travails of, of, of Travel Lodge, which is a major tenant of secure income reach, uh, it's a situation where the owners of these businesses are, who are particularly levered are keen to try and get landlords to contribute to the pain. But we're hoping that both sides see sense and there will be uh, an adjustment on rent, but ultimately Travel Lodge will return to operate the, these hotels uh, and, and keep their business going. And I add Landsec there because actually Accor is about 8% of all Landsec income. Unfortunately, that income is on a turnover structure with those hotels. So Landsec is very much um, sharing in the pain of that lack of income. And then underweight, UW, uh, non-food retail. And that's really been all about something that for those of you who've either listened to me in the past uh, or read the TR Property Annual Report, the manager statement, uh, you will know that I've been bleating about my concerns about retail for, gosh, five or six years now. Um, and I think what the COVID crisis has done is, is really accelerate um, these structural shifts. And we have, haven't held any of those names in the UK. In fact, our UK exposure has really been through supermarket income REIT. And we, we actually were a core and a stone investor of supermarket income REIT when it originally raised 100 million a couple of years ago and actually is really the only pan-European uh, retail stock that's actually standing ahead of its pre-COVID price, which we're very pleased about. And it's recently raised money and done an incredibly uh, smart deal. Um, so I'd encourage any of you who are interested in, in supermarkets and to look at the website. Ben and Steve, who run that business, are very, very bright young men. And um, I think there's some uh, webinars to listen to as well. And then on the European side, um, here we, we, we have had some exposure. And that's really for the difference between the UK and the European companies uh, is, is quite stark. And it's there's three clear reasons. The first is that the UK has been burdened for many years with this upward only uh, rent review structure, these encouraging tenants to take very long leases and then uh, have these five yearly upward only rent reviews. And, 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 and landlords got used to just trying to massage this these rents upwards and create more evidence to charge their tenants more at the rent review cycle and less about the actual uh, occupational efficiency for the retailer. Whereas um, on the continent, leases are much shorter, they're tied to indexation, tenants can get out much more easily and therefore you get a, a rebasing to an open market rent, an affordable rent much more often. And then the other problem with the UK, the UK is property taxes. You know, the rating system is... Is, is grotesquely uh, unfair and too much burden um, falls on retailers uh, as opposed to those who are selling online. Uh, I'm sure it will get uh, resolved uh, by the government in due course, but of course there's an awful lot else it's got on its plate and that long overdue restructuring may, may still be some time yet. And then the last point in Europe is they are just a lot further behind in um, harnessing online retailing. Amazon only arrived in, in Italy sort of three years ago. The percentage of sales uh, in Italy, uh, all retail sales, ex food and fuel is probably only about two or three percent in Italy relative to what it is at, at sort of 22 percent here in the UK. That doesn't mean it isn't coming their way of course it is a just a more slowly melting ice, ice cube but there is an opportunity for landlords and retailers alike to to understand what you know what has happened in the us what has happened in in in, in the uk uh and and work out what they're going to do about it how to how to combat that um and we have you know we have higher hopes okay so now turning to our our physical portfolio which in in some respects is quite modest in scale it's about eight percent of the asset so i have often have investors say well marcus why do you bother to have physical and there are three very clear reasons the first is we we like to be able to say to shareholders of tr property look we are also practitioners we're out there trying to improve our assets 
uh, to gain planning permissions, to refurbish, to regenerate, to do deals with tenants, um, to take advantage of market opportunities. And, and then at the same time, be able to say to the companies that we're in, um, investing in, um, when I, you know, we see in our offices, obviously, normally, we probably have 120 meetings a year with management. And we like these companies that we're invested in or potentially invested in to understand that they're dealing with practitioners, people who understand the real estate market. And I find often that when the, the, the sell side a real estate equity analyst community will often say, well, we think that the profit that X or Y company is going to make out of Z scheme next year is X million. Planning should be forthcoming. We, we, we know damn well that planning can take a lot longer. There are many more issues that can delay the returns of these things. Or alternatively, we have situations where we've bid on an asset and we've come fifth or sixth. And we're like, wow, the market demand for this uh, asset is much, much greater than the stock market is thinking. And that brings me to my second reason for owning physical is the fact that the, you know, the physical commercial property market, uh, it's a private market. There's, you know, there are deals being done all the time and not, not always uh, or, or only a small percentage with, with listed companies. And, and therefore, information is something which is uh, out there and you need to be able to get the physical brokers to help furnish you with with information about deals and the fact that these brokers may well be able to earn um, uh, revenue from us through agency through commission by bringing us transactions means that we're just a we're just another one of their clients and that's great because we are picking up market intelligence uh, all the time and then thirdly it's just you know good old-fashioned we, we can make money out of out of what we own and then we'll come on to what we've actually done uh, in the portfolio in a second. But just on that second line, uh, worth just touching on our rent roll. We effectively are going to collect um, 95%. We, we have written off 5%. And that is because two of our, our tenants, one was a retail unit, one was a retail unit, the other was a gym. Um, both of which were closed and they just weren't able to operate. And so we felt it was inappropriate to defer that rent. We've chosen to write it off um, on the basis and on the understanding that they will pay uh, the next quarter. And then the deferrals are mostly moving from quarterly in advance to uh, to monthly. Um, and we have collected all of that due on the 1st of April, 1st of May and uh, and the 1st of June. So that's good. So what have we done? Our largest asset, the colonnades in Bayswater. Between March 15 and March 16, we, we basically converted it from the picture on the left to the one on the right. Apologies to those of you who've seen the presentation before, but you know it was a really successful transaction for us. Waitrose on the left-hand picture, just around where the white car is, that was the entrance to uh, a small Waitrose. They'd taken the assignment of a lease from Budgeons. Uh, it was only 20,000 feet, and they said, look, we want a much, much bigger uh, supermarket, and we persuaded them to go up to first floor level. And they're like, we don't have supermarkets on first floor. And we say, well, if you'd like to be here, that's what we're going to offer you. And they eventually agreed. As you could see on the right hand picture in the left hand corner, um, you'll see a travelator uh, and escalator that, that takes you up to first floor. And that then allowed us to let the ground floor uh, on the right hand side. We have we have spec savers. Uh, and then in the middle, we've just agreed terms or well, pre COVID to a restaurant operator. Uh, and hopefully that will progress. And then around the corner, we have our gym. Uh, and Graham and Green, the home furnishings uh, business. But this has been a, a very profitable scheme for us. The upper parts are, are, are flats, um, 242 of them. And uh, this scheme was built in the 1970s. And actually, the leases granted then were, were only uh, 80 and 90 years. So we've actually been selling lease extensions, which has been a, a very profitable exercise uh, for us. And then another scheme in, in, in Wandsworth. This is an industrial estate. If any of you know, uh, Wandsworth Bridge, the Tonsleys, which is a, a very uh, a, a pretty part of Victorian houses. And down at the bottom of the hill, there's this industrial estate which was built post-war. The site had been cleared um, uh, and uh, these units were built in the 1970s. And I bought this estate, gosh, 12, 13 years ago now, and the rents were £8 a foot. And uh, we've now, we've now got the rents up to £24 a foot. But even with the rents that high, we still found it uh, potentially more valuable to convert this into a mixture of multi-story industrial, some offices, uh, and 106 residential units. And we received planning permission uh, in November. Uh, we're right on top of Wandsworth Town Railway Station, which is a great station for us uh, and for the scheme. And we will therefore you know, probably look to sell this site um, uh, in about a year's time. Uh, so moving on, just a couple of 
pull back now uh, for the last 10 minutes of my former part of the presentation just to have a, a, a look at um, sort of the market conditions of where we see things moving. And this is a slide that some of you may well have seen before and really examining, you know, why you would own real estate. And, uh, you know, it is an income stream with a capital kicker and that capital kicker comes from two angles. The first is the yield comparison. So the fact that you are you know, today getting such a huge uh, margin uh, over fixed income. Um, and the second point is rental growth. Now, what we have here is that, you know, that this slide obviously predates the COVID crisis. But I, I would argue that if we can have a staggered lifting of lockdown from midsummer, we will see that tenant demand stabilize. Now, that's excluding non-food retail. Uh, as I said, I think retail is really now in a significant accelerating structural shift. And I think there's still going to be a lot of weakness um, in those retail income streams. And then I attached to that, the original slide had um, non-existent development cycle 2008 to 2014. And my point here is that post the GFC, we saw very little speculative development. The banks and the traditional lenders to optimistic developers um, just, just weren't there. And we saw, you know, this was a, a global phenomena. Um, we saw, you know, very little new construction. And actually what, what real estate markets love uh, is when there's a, a restricted supply. Because when you do have too much supply in a mature economy or mature economies of, of, of Europe, it just takes a very long time for business to absorb that oversupply of space. And really the problem we've got with retail isn't that there's new supply, there's just no demand, which leads to effectively a, 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 a net oversupply. But I've added uh, on this slide more recently, deferred development cycle 2020-21 and that's really what we're seeing right here and now take the west end of london 65 percent all schemes that are under development at the moment in sorry central london not in the west end are um are, are actually uh, pre-let so if you want to go and find yourself forty thousand square feet of brand new space in the west end you're really getting a struggle and in fact, uh, Great Portland, um, a, a great business, uh, excuse the, the pun in intended, um, has just announced a deal with um, with a French bank, uh, BMP Paribas, for 40,000 square feet um, at a rent of over uh, over £100 a foot. And I talked to this bank, because we, we know them quite well, uh, to the director in charge of this transaction. And he said it was just exhausting because really they, they didn't really have many options and uh, they very much wanted to do the transaction. And that's very encouraging from my point of view, because even if we do end up with a temporary demand strike as we go through the COVID situation, the fact is I don't see a lot of supply coming through. And those developers who are thinking of pressing the button kind of beginning of this year and for whatever reasons didn't clearly aren't about to press the button now. They're going to need a lot more clarity on, on how tenant demand is going to move through as we as we live with social distancing and, and um, use of elevators, desk density, etc. And you know that that will stop development, which is which is you know again as I said encouraging. And then valuation clearly share prices have uh, reacted uh, abruptly as we would expect, and then they've bounced. Um, but we, we have some very interesting valuations at the moment and, and opportunities in the market and. Please bear in mind that much more real estate is owned privately than publicly. And um, in the last month, we've had some a number of very important announcements about private equity and institutional capital buying lumpy chunks of listed companies. Um, we've seen Brookfield uh, pick up 7% uh, of British land. There's a Hong Kong-based uh, investor who's bought, a, uh, uh, I think, a 2 or 3% of land securities. Uh, we've seen Sammy Lee Tack sell his 20% of, of, of Shaftesbury um, to, to, to Capco. Um, and then the other end of the scale, we, we've seen an opportunistic European real estate fund by 12% uh, of Mackay Securities. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. There's, there's, you know, clearly, there's capital out there that thinks that listed real estate companies uh, are offering sweet pickings at the moment. So outlook, I mean, things are moving very fast. Every day is bringing something different. Uh, it's hard to quantify the impact, but what we can be sure of is this huge amount of 
of bank and government stimulus across the globe. From where I'm sitting, long and strong income just becomes even more valuable. You know, we're, we're long of healthcare, long of these residential names, not just in Germany, but also in Sweden and in Finland. Um, again, which have other markets which are you know, fun fundamentally undersupplied in terms of, of, of residential property. Dispersion of returns, uh, we've talked about quite a lot of that. Um, and I would highlight you know, our concerns over something like the service office market, where we think that you know, in the very short run, tenants will, if they can get up um, uh, these, these leases, if they're very short term, they will. Um, they'll pause the breath, they'll consolidate, they'll look to see uh, how the world is going to evolve. And that is going to be a, a cash flow problem for these serviced office operators. Um, that's going to be a problem. And our valuation differential, as you saw highlighted in that slide with all the, with all the data on it, it's very much about um, not only subsector exposure, avoiding those pure consumer focused sectors, but really about income reliability. Uh, and just to, to recap what I've already said, this is a cash flow demand strike, not a balance sheet crisis. And both offensive and defensive capital calls will be a theme. Um, I wrote this slide uh, a month ago, and, and since then we've seen uh, a number of offensive, uh, we've supermarket income re raise money, we've seen big yellow uh, raise money, a number of European players um, have raised money, and then maybe uh, as things deteriorate, then we're going to see those defensive calls. And you can see that the market is very concerned about uh, some of these retail names standing on very, very deep discounts to their asset value. That's the market saying, A, we don't believe the asset value, um, and, and B, actually, you, you may need to come for capital, uh, and that will obviously need to be at a, at a, at a discount to the, to the share price, and therefore, we're going to continue to drive your price down. And then we've had some, in the last few weeks, some incredible short squeezes where the market has turned around and said, no, you're not going bust. Uh, and we've seen Hammerson go from uh, from 40 pen to one pound 20. Bear in mind, uh, in January, it was it was two pounds 10. So, you know, there's some people who've made a lot of money, some people who've lost a lot of money. But um, I think I'll just pause there and uh, see if we have uh, any questions on the line. We do have a couple of questions. One is from Clive Owen that says, many global companies are reviewing their need for offices following the COVID situation. Some feel they can shed up to 20% of their office accommodation. How might this impact the TR Property Investment Trust? Excellent question, Clive. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think the first point to make is big picture, uh, there are both pull and pushes uh, for office space. I mean, the two clear ones are one, you know, the world isn't going back in its entirety to a pre-COVID environment of going in on a Monday and leaving the office on a Friday. Um, and we are going to, you know, working from home, working remotely, possibly traveling less globally is all going to be a, a, a feature. The issue for, uh, particularly for large companies, is really about office density. And this is the, uh, the, the, the kind of the bull factor, is it? Well, it's not really a bull factor, but it's something that mitigates the bear, the bear response. Um, we've seen, you know, I started work at Knight Frank and Rutley as it was back in 1990 as a, as a surveyor. And back then, your, your office density was probably around 200 square feet per employee. Um, we're now down to about 80. Uh, and that's a combination of better building construction, um, air handling systems, speed of lifts, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a just squish, squish people in. It didn't feel uncomfortable that you were, you were a bit more squeezed in. Um, uh, and, it, it, and that's really because of the quality of, of the environment. But it meant that for, for corporates, their, their real estate overhead didn't really increase anything like uh, other cost bases, even though rents were, were rising. You've now got a situation where you're going to have less uh, employees in the office at any one time, um, but you're going to have to unfortunately reverse some of that densification. Uh, and that then the question is, well, are you going to allow the corporate that the cost of your uh, of your over of your real estate overhead to increase part of your corporate overheads uh, or, or or not? And that's something that I think we're still wrestling with. And the comment I made in the in the outlook of the annual report of TR Property was this is very much a, uh, a, a question that can only be answered in years rather than months. Um, clearly, there are some businesses out there who already wished to reduce the amount of space 
that they occupied. And I think there is a major bank in um, in Canary Wharf who had already made uh, the decision to reduce the amount of space, and that has been been and it, and and that chief executive of that company has been extremely vocal about that and very much jumped onto the you know, the COVID bandwagon for reduction, etc. And and I and I'm I think that's you know in that's a particular uh, situation. Um, I think for many of us, what a couple of months of working from home, I run a team of 11, um, and I think we are probably uh, running at, uh, working remotely 100%, we're about 85% of productivity. We are losing uh, a, a part of what we do by not all being there together, um, and that's the, the, the ad hoc response, that's the questions which you put the phone down to a colleague, you think, sugar i should have asked that other question it's the speed of turnaround of documentations all of which will will speed up if to work 100 percent remotely but i think that's less likely um so we we don't predict the end of the office but i do agree with you that there is certainly this puts a lid on rental growth for a while while the market sorts itself out um and we are not predicting uh rental growth um, uh, for the next two or three years. Um, having said that, share prices are predicting quite dramatic falls in rent. So I think that's where we probably where, where we differ. As I said, short run, yes, there's a lot of sorting out to be done, and we think that those uh, operate th those companies that have a lot of very short term leases um, are likely to be impacted. I hope that's given you some sort of an answer. And Bill Hall asks, in your geographic exposure, there's no exposure to Switzerland. Is this because it's impossible to buy in Switzerland or that you don't think it offers value for money? Great, great question. We, we can buy in Switzerland. There are uh, four companies um, that you can get you know, material exposure to, two which dominate the market, um, uh, SPS and PSP. So you, you don't want to be a dyslexic fund manager because that could... could could land you in hot water. Um, the, the 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 problem for us with, with Switzerland is quite simply that the market is really quite moribund. There isn't a lot of rental growth. Um, uh, SPS in particular has a lot of retail exposure. Um, it owns something called House of Brands, which is a sort of Selfridges uh, of uh, of Switzerland. Um, and we've we've found actually that. Um, it's you know that the uh, the fundament the market fundamentals are are not that strong. However, because of negative interest rates, uh, we did miss a trick earlier last year where we found that local investors were really piling into these names because they offered um, three and a half percent dividend yield, which of course was was relative to the, the local market conditions huge. Um, that that seems to have rolled through now and and and. They have also generally acted as a safe haven, but they haven't really performed that well uh, in uh, in the COVID crisis. So, yeah, absolutely, we, we could, you know, the benchmark weight uh, uh, is about 6%. So, you know, we are significantly underweight Switzerland. And Malcolm Cooper asks, you don't appear to have investment in the large e-commerce warehousing companies like B-Box and E-Box. Is this correct? And what's the rationale there? Good question. Thank you for raising it. Um, we have a huge exposure to the logistics and industrial sector um, across Europe. Um, our major holdings are in the UK, we've talked about Seagrove, but also London Metric. And then in Europe, it's Argon, it's VIB Vermogen, Warehouses uh, uh, de Pau in, in the Netherlands, Mont Montea uh, in, in, in Belgium, uh, and Catena in Sweden. Uh, quite simply, it's... Um, those names are very much investor developers. And what we've found is as the, um, the particularly the big box market has matured, uh, you've seen yields compress. And we absolutely did own an awful lot of Tritax big box uh, in the past. And we have you know, sold it um, some time ago now and very much rotated into uh, investor developers where we saw, you know, the, the opportunity for for, for for quicker and deeper gains. Now, the big box guys are very clever. Uh, I know them well. I've known them for many years. And you saw them also see the fact that yields couldn't compress forever. And they went out and bought uh, DB Symmetry. Um, and we think that at the time, we felt that they paid quite a lot of money for that. B 
business and that the outlook looked, you know, if we're thinking back to sort of last summer, uh, a little bit more questionable. And, um, and sure enough, the share price, you know, underperformed its competitors, European competitors during the latter half of last year. And then, of course, in the in the recent past, it's had a, a fantastic run as, you know, as really, you know, all logistics uh, has performed very well uh, in the COVID crisis. But just because we have a we now have a situation where there's a fundamental lack of uh, of, of logistics and storage space. Uh, and we think and I'm quite confident that um, uh, this company will undoubtedly uh, its its development arm DB Symmetry will we, you know will start to um, uh, produce some some prelets and some development gains. Uh, uh, however, the share price at 145 um, for me is very much up with events. We are very happy with our holding in Seagro, and we're happy at the moment not owning Tritax Big Box, but owning all these other names, particularly across. Europe. The same would apply to Ebox. Uh, again, it's an investor, not a developer, and it's the same, uh, making the same point uh, again. Marcus, that's the end of the questions. Thank you for a tremendous presentation, and thank you all for attending.